come up with ways of determining when the left path algebras are isomorphic. So the question is, suppose you have left path algebras, which you have two graphs, E and F, and their left path algebras are isomorphic, say, as rings. We want to know what the relationship is between the two graphs. This is a question that Rhonda talked about before. In fact, we don't really know the answer to this question. Something people are quite interested in. But what I'm going to show you is how the groupoid model can tell us something about this. It doesn't answer it, but it tells us something. Um, related to this is something called the abrams talford conjecture. I think it came up last week. Did we talk about this last week? Anybody say it? Anyway, Rondo might have mentioned it. He talked a little about graphs, these are algebras. And the question, the conjecture says, if you have two left path algebras that are isomorphic as rings, as rings only, um, does that imply that the C star algebras are isomorphic as C star algebras? Not rings, C star. As C star algebras. So that's the conjecture from a paper of theirs, 2008 or something. And it's not known. It remains an open question. But again, I'm going to show you how the group work model tells us something about this a little bit. It's related to an open question that uh, Muga talked about. There was this algebraic Kirchberg Phillips classification theorem, and it's not known about whether that delta she talked about had anything it still worked when your delta was involved. So we're going to talk about diagonal preserving isomorphisms. So what is this? So the diagonal of the Levitat algebra, so I'm using my notational convention. If you want to think about this in the more standard notational convention, I mean mu, mu star. Sorry, the star's in the wrong spot. That's a C star. Star should be down here. That star should be on the path mu. So that is what we call the diagonal. It's the span of things that we form mu and mu star, where mu is on a half. And in the groupoid, this turns out to be, in fact, the Steinberg algebra associated to the unit space. So we've talked about this a little bit. So that is the diagonal. And there's a theorem by Topa Carlson and James Rout that says if you have two directed graphs, and an integral domain, R needs to be an integral domain, so a field would work, but also something like the integers would work. Um, integral domain with identity, so any commutative ring with identity that has no zero divisors. And the following are equivalent, and I'll only tell you one so far. There's a ring isomorphism between the left paths of algebras that preserves the diagonal. It takes the diagonal of one to the diagonal of the other. And what is the punchline? This happens if and only if the group points are isomorphic. And in fact, that is true. If and only if you have, there's a notion of the diagonal of the C star algebra. It's a completion of this diagonal. So we can talk about diagonal preserving isomorphisms of the C star algebra. So we have this result. And this result like stems from, say, on the shoulders of giants sort of thing. So I'll give you a little bit of, of how Carlson and Rout did it, because it used technology established by a lot of people. So way back, quite a long time ago, in the C-star algebra setting, in the setting of effective groupoid C-star algebra, Renault, Jean Renault, proved an equivalence of two and three. And then, more recently, um, Nathan Brownlow, Toka Carlson, and Mike Whitaker Proved a version of two and three for graph C star algebras. And then um, I was able to prove with collaborators John Brown and Astrid and Huff a version of uh, one and two, but we had to require our isomorphism to be a star isomorphism. And then there's a paper by Rusba and Perry and I think Aiden Sims and Johan. Bosa, who have an algebraic thing about effective groupoids. So I'm not really giving you that many details. I'm just trying to name all the names of the people involved. So really, Carlson and Rupp sort of took some of the technology developed in this previous paper and cleverly put it together to get this result. And it's quite, I think, a pretty exciting result in a sort of on the way to giving us something to 
to it, say about that Abrams Tomsford conjecture, so that if your rings are isomorphic and the diagonal is preserved, then in fact the C star algebra is also isomorphic. And that all is a groupoid property. So this is all about the groupoid. But the question is, and maybe somebody here knows the answer, I don't know. Is there an example of an isomorphism, a ring isomorphism between Levitt path algebras that is not diagonal preserving? I don't think we know the answer to that. Diagonal preserving has to do, I mean, it's related to this thing that Newton was talking about in this determinant sign, if things switch sign. And if it's not diagonal preserving, things switch sign in such a way that we don't really know. So I don't think we have an example. So it's possible that this is everything. That all isomorphic of the path algebras have diagonal preserving isomorphisms. So it's sort of an open question in the area. I think they're pretty significant. Star isomorphism over integers and Sorensen. Yeah. Yeah, there are various bits. I don't know. Yeah, I'll talk about that result in a minute. There's various hypotheses you can put on that isomorphism, ring isomorphism, star ring isomorphism, algebra isomorphism. In fact, these Steinberg algebras are star algebras. So there's lots going on here. It's quite an active area of research, hot topic. So big open questions. If you wanted to answer this question right here, people would be excited to see the answer to that. Am I right? We don't know the answer to that question. Whether we know whether that maybe people have thought about it. I don't think we know that. I certainly don't. All right, so relating to this is a big and open question in the Rabbit Path algebra. The graph C star algebra is this thing called the Kuhn slice, and I've mentioned it in conversations because I think it's so bizarre. So there are two graphs. One I'll just call E, but that's the standard, these are nice ones where the arrows aren't going to matter because they've got lots of loops. So that's our standard rows with two petals. And the Kuhn slice of that is this thing. It's a move you perform on there. Looks like this. So this is my E. This is my F. This is what we call the Kuhn slice. Um, we were being formed out there. I think it's something that was formed first by Adam Sorensen. Adam Sorensen is the moves, graph moves expert, I think. He is, if you want to know anything about graph moves, talk to Adam Sorensen. Very nice guy, too. So, there's this thing I talked about the other day. There's a big uh, classification theorem of C star algebra that tell us those two C star algebra are isomorphic as C star algebra. And in fact, we know the C star algebra isomorphism here is not diagonal preserving. We know, we know that. And so we know the groupoids of these two are not isomorphic, which is good. Because I spent some time at one point trying to prove they were isomorphic and I could not come up with anything. So in fact, they're not. These theorems tell us. And this is what Sorensen and Johansson show that the Levitt path algebras associated with these things are not isomorphic as ring, maybe as algebras. Normally as rings. Actually, I don't know the hypotheses here. They're, but the point is their coefficients are functional. What's that? They prove that they are not star isomorphic. Not star isomorphic. Maybe. Yeah, I might be messing up these hypotheses. So Terry thinks it's a star isomorphic. Um, Levitt path algebra is where the coefficients come from the integers. But they use the properties of integers in quite a significant way. For example, if you have things multiplying together to equal 1 and your coefficients are integers, that's quite a bit easier to deal with. But we do not know whether they're star isomorphic or isomorphic as Levitt path algebra is where the coefficients come from a field field of complex numbers. So this is something that a lot of people are very interested in as well. We don't know. This elusive Kuhn slice, that's why I said the elusive Kuhn slice, because it's strange. 
So another question, if you could answer this question. Lots of questions. So just I'm trying to introduce this to you. There's lots of questions in this classification area. Um, I'll just say quick things about Merida equivalence. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because it would take up more time than I have. But we'll get some vocabulary. I'm not giving you the definition of Merida equivalent. It's come up last week, but the idea is if two rings are Merida equivalent, then they have the same ideal structure, for example. There are other properties of it that are preserved, but the ideal structure is preserved. So if you're looking about simplicity or ideals, it's a way uh, to approach it. But just another vocabulary word. If we have a subset of the unit space of a group point, we call it X, then the saturation of X is, we take R inverse of X, if there's a missing parenthesis there, R inverse of X, and then do S of that. Called the saturation. And there's a theorem by Muley, Renault, and Williams that was in the setting of C star algebras, and uh, Aiden Sims and I sort of translated it. So suppose you have an Eiffel House or a groupoid. Sorry, my groupoid here is called H. I don't mean that's a group, it's a groupoid. And you have X, a subset of its unit space that is clopen, so it's closed and open, such that its saturation, that's what this is. Is all of the unit space. Then, if you take this groupoid defined to be x h x, so that's actually restricting h to x. x h x is because um, x is a set of units, so it's really h in h such that the source of h and the range of h. So you can restrict and get a new group void. It's a clopen subgroup void of H, and in fact that it's ample and Hausdorff, and the two Steinberg algebras are Morita. So it's a, an abstract construction to build some Morita algebras. And I'm not going to go into the details, but there's a couple, many different ways you can apply this to Levitt path algebra. It's just trying to think about how can you restrict the unit space in such a way to get sets whose saturation is everything. There's ways of restricting to certain vertices or certain paths. But a lot of Levitt path algebra results, in fact, follow from this. So, for example, there's this desingularization. I think that's done in Levitt path algebra. Um, which says that every level path algebra is Merida equivalent to a level path algebra associated to a real finite graph without sources or a, a graph that all vertices are regular vertices. So if you're looking at ideal structure, you, this desingularization result says that you're allowed to just restrict your attention to these well behaved graphs. So that's a res uh, consequence of this theorem in a particular way. Also, these other moves in splitting, out splitting, and shifts can be realized in this way. Um, and yes, this result just gives Merida equivalents, but for, I think, is it shifts and insulating, you actually get equal isomorphisms. And there's lots of play that can be done here. So I'm not giving you a lot of details, but I think this is another place where Steinberg algebra view is quite clean. This result has lots of applications to so how to make it work in the Right, that's the end of my first talk, so give me a second. Let's see how far we get in this one. Now, when I first started giving talks, when I was a you know, PhD student and afterward, I must have talked a lot faster, because I always like ended super early. Now I feel like I'm doing the other thing. I've relaxed a little bit, not so worry about it. <laughs> so this one we're going to focus all our attention on open invariant subsets and ideals. So we'll define what we mean by that. So what am I going to do now? Open invariant subsets in unit space, we'll define that. Then we'll talk about simplicity. And then we'll talk about ideals. Part of view, this is a little silly. Just give it a Invariant subsets of the unit space. So what do we mean by invariant subsets? So 
So we say uh, set u in the unit space. We're calling it a unit space now because we're in a topological viewpoint, so it's actually a topological space. Is invariant if the following condition is satisfied. So if you have the range of gamma for some gamma inside of u, that must mean that the source of gamma is also in u. You can prove, we will in a second, that a subset u is invariant if and only if u equals, you remember what that is called? We just did that. The saturation. So if and only if, if u equals its saturation. <coughs> its saturation, in fact, of an arbitrary set is a way to build an invariant set. So suppose u is invariant, so we'll go one direction here. Clearly we have u as a subset of the saturation because on u the source and range are the identity max. Uh, then we fix an element x in the saturation, and it's, so it's source of range inverse of gamma, so then that x must be the source of gamma for some gamma in the range inverse of u. This is sort of an easy proof that's probably easier to sit down and do yourself and try to figure out my version. But, um, but that range of gamma is in u, so x being the source of gamma must also be in u by that invariance property. Then the other way, suppose you have a gamma such that the range of gamma is in u. So we're trying to show this invariance condition. Then gamma is in range inverse u. And so the source must be in there. And saturation, which is all so that maybe that's something you should not look at my proof and just try to write down the proof yourself. So what are examples of invariant sets? So group bundle. The group bundle was when we had that our group point is a disjoint union of groups, and every element has matching source and range. You know, it's all isotropy. So any subset of the unit space is invariant because if it's in there, if something has source that it also has range that. So that's an example. Here's a non-trivial example. Trying to construct a very easy one. Suppose I take an X to be this three element set ABC and to find an equivalence relation. I can't find an equivalence relation. We can prove that that relation is an equivalence relation. Then it's a group void. We talked about that. And the sets B and AC are both invariant, but the set A is not. So why is that? So B, the only thing that has range B is this unit. So it's also got source B, so that's fine. Let's talk about why A is not. There's this element right here in the group point, AC, that has range A. First thing is the is range. Is there a comma missing here between the first two terms? Oh, yeah, yeah there's a comma missing. <coughs> so this element here has range A, but source C C is not in the set A, so it's not invariant. So it's just an easy sort of example to see what we need. So here's a characterization in the directed graph setting, just sort of intuitive anyway. Suppose we take some uh, subset U of the unit space of our boundary path group void. So what is the unit space of the boundary path group void? This notation. I also call that X. That's our infinite paths and finite paths to sources and regular roots and vertex. We say, so u is invariant, then if that's true, then any path that is eventually the same as x is also in u. to do something to make it come out how. Does anybody know? Those of you who have lectured and the lights went off, how do you make that go back on? It, it comes back. It just comes back. Just back. Yeah. 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 Ah, there we go. Okay. 
Okay, we were talking about what it means for a subset. I lost my mic, but that's all right. A subset U to be invariant in this graph groupoid, and the idea is down here. If you have some x that's in there, then it needs to contain. Um, I said contains and this is not very well written. This should be an, and it should be every element of the equivalence class of x. So this is not very nice. Contains every element of the equivalence class of x with respect to tail equivalence. So that's sort of it's all the equivalence classes of the elements in here. So I said we'd talk a little more about effective groupoids. I had a couple of questions from people in between that said the graph groupoid you said is always effective. I want to make sure I did not mean to say that graph groupoid is always effective. What I wanted to say is the zero rated bit is always effective. The whole thing might not be, as we'll see in a second. Um, and at this stage, we're going to start thinking about a field because I'm going to be talking about the ideal structure and simplicity. And if I have a ring that's not a field, then we're going to get ideals in that that will contribute ideals in the whole thing. And we don't want to worry about that right now. We'll worry about that a little later, maybe, if there's sort of. So I'm just known as cake. So now I'm back in the world where you guys are happy, maybe. So recall we said it was a uh, group is effective if it satisfies this condition. So if every compact over the bisection outside of the unit space <laughs> contains an element that's not isotropy, so its source and range are different. So if you have a directed graph, then as we mentioned when we did the uniqueness theorem, uh, the group board is effective if and only if it satisfies condition L. For me, that's every cycle has an entrance. Here's a quick outline of the proof. So one direction is quite easy. Suppose your graph has a cycle C with no entrance. So in terms of infinite paths, once you're on that <coughs> cycle, you stay there. You can't, your chicken can't get out. <coughs> so then we have this compact open bisection, ZCC, comma C. What does that look like? So the definition of those things looks like CCX, comma 1, comma CX. Right, because the difference in length between cc and c is 1. But as I said, that x, the only possibility, because we don't have an entrance, is for it to be infinite c's. So this open set, it's outside of the unit space, and it's in fact just that singleton. What is the source and range of that? So the range is the infinite path of all c's. Its source the infinite path of all c's equal to each other. So there's an open bisection outside of the unit space that doesn't have any element in the source from h different. So not effective. So the condition L failing means not effective. The, the other direction, if you have, I think the easiest way to prove it is suppose every cycle does have an entrance and show that it is uh, effective. So you can do it for compact open bisection outside of the unit space. So if I fix, I'm going to call it Z for notational ease to be some compact open bisection where mu and nu don't equal each other. That will get us outside of the unit space. Then I'm not writing down the details here, but you can show that Z must contain an element. So that's what an arbitrary elements look like. But it must contain one in particular where these two things don't equal each other. And the way you do that is you have to consider the possibilities for mu and nu. So for example, if mu and nu, if one isn't an initial segment of the other one, if their z mu and z nu are disjoint, then this will be true for every element in z. Otherwise, one is an initial segment of the other, but then you'll get like a little cycle, and you can just build an x. One of them will be repeating around that cycle, the other one will be taking the entrance. So, again, it's just a partial proof, but that's the idea. I don't know anywhere where it's written down in this context. I know it's written down in the higher rate graph context. Just another example, if you have a non-trivial discrete group, it's never effective because singletons have matching source and range in the group. It doesn't satisfy the condition. I guess the discrete group is effective. Back in the is it C, C, and C in the middle? Is one sitting or is the length of C? Right here? Oh. 
Oh yeah, you're right. I'm thinking that's you're correct. So it's not a one. It's the length of C C minus the length of C, which is the length of C. In my mind, I was thinking of it as a loop, but you're correct. It's just an arbitrary cycle. So that's a mistake right there. Should be a length of C in the middle. But still, we're thinking of that length as non-zero, so it's not in a unit space. So the result for simplicity. Uh, again, by John Brown and Cindy Farley and Aiden Sins. So you need Hausdorff ample and you need a field. Then the Steinberg algebra is simple if and only if it's effective and the unit space has no open invariant subsets. Open invariant subsets. That condition sometimes usually is called minimal. So that's the theorem. And I said we can actually recover the simplicity theorem for Levitt path algebras. Levitt path algebra is simple if and only if it satisfies condition L, and I claim that the condition having no non-trivial saturated hereditary subsets matches up with this condition here. And we'll talk about that later, but it is true. So you can recover that theorem. Now, I mentioned yesterday that I would tell you the result that got me excited about doing these algebraic things, and this is it. So there was a big surprise to us when we were working on this. So what was the big surprise? So we were able to use the techniques we developed for that Steinberg algebra theorem to prove a simplicity theorem for groupoid C-star algebras. And not only for ample groupoid C-star algebras, but for more general ones, for ones that are called et al. So ample ones are these things that have a basis of compact open bisections, very special topological spaces. And a tall group boy is, you got to add this locally compact condition, but then it's a group boy that has a basis of open bisections. So I believe it's more general. It's more general in its definition. I don't have a proof that the class of algebra is associated to these things are more general. But what's particular is there's no, we don't have Steinberg algebras anymore when they're at all because you don't have, just the structure doesn't work anymore. We, we depend a lot on that compact open bisections. So how does the C-star algebra work? This is just a quick write-down. The C-star algebra associated to a groupoid is, if you look at the continuous functions from G to the complex number with compact support, <coughs> so that sub C, and you take a completion, there's two different ways to do this. It's pretty complicated, but that is the idea. It's a much more general thing. But we were able to take these Steinberg algebra results and prove this simplicity theorem for these C star algebras. So if you have a tall Hausdorff group void, then it's group void C star algebra is simple if and only if the following conditions are satisfied. So this one, as I said, there's two different ways to do this completion. And so this first condition says that they're, in fact, you get the same algebra no matter which norm you use, effective in the middle. So we were pretty excited about this. And it really, it answered a question that had been open in groupoid C star algebra since Renault's original uh, work in 1980. We didn't have necessary and sufficient conditions. So it's more than 30 years. And the reason why was, in fact, I, I mean, I think the reason why is we had a condition that if certain thing held, then it was simple, but it wasn't effective. It was something slightly different than that. It turns out to be the same in some settings, but I think that it was because the wrong condition was there. And when we were working in the Steinberg algebra settings, we thought it was that going to be that condition as well, but things are just, there's not as much to worry about, because you don't have the norm around. You don't have to worry about whether these things are equal or which norm you're using or anything like that. So we were able to figure out what the right condition was. So this is when I became really excited about these algebras because I thought maybe they can be, they seem to be able to help solve theorems and see so Yeah, and I don't know, maybe other people here do, another example where this has happened. In general, the Levitt path algebra, C-star, graph C-star algebra, the theories are really in parallel to one another. And if anything, the C-star stuff helps the Levitt stuff because it came first and so the tell us what some of the right conditions are. At least I think that's how it was. And now, again, they're quite a bit different as you look at these classification questions sometimes. Does anybody else know 
of a result in C-star algebras that was proven using techniques developed in the purely algebraic setting? It's a question I'm asking, so if you think of one, let me know. I'd be curious to know. And we now have started, this is sort of a line of research we're trying to use. There's other questions, like I've spent a long time trying to establish necessary and sufficient conditions for a purely infinite simple group void C star algebra. And now my new plan of attack is to try to figure out the right conditions in the star algebra. All right, so that's for simplicity. Back to the purely algebraic setting. So now let's think about what's not simple. So we know two things can go wrong. It can be not effective or it can be, uh, you can have open and various subsets of the answer space. And I think it's pretty clear that if it's not effective, then you get non-trivial ideals. So for example, a very simple example, it's not simple. That's the point. So if you take just the group with two elements, then this generates a non-trivial ideal. So a group that's non-trivial is not effective. We're thinking of it as a discrete group. Similarly, we have examples in the elaborate path algebra. If it doesn't satisfy condition L, we have this cycle without entrance, and you can show that this thing, maybe that's not the notation you're used to, that's the translation over into the elaborate path algebra, I mean into the Steinberg algebra, that thing generates a non-trivial idea. But how this works in the abstract setting is pretty hard, because when you have effectiveness failing, you have a whole open bisection that's all isotropy, meaning you have isotropy groups that might be different, and so it's very complicated. So this is a, a, still lots we don't know about ideal structure of Levitt path algebras in general, when things that are not effective. So we're just going to, for now, on restrict our attention <coughs> to effective, because that's a situation where we can do some do more things. In fact, we'll need to be a little stronger than that. All right, so suppose G is effective, and let's talk about the other condition failing. The second condition for simplicity was no open invariant subsets, so suppose we have one, an open invariant subset. We can define the set, I'll write it as I of U, to be the span of one sub V's where the source of V is in U. Since our U is invariant, <coughs> That means also the range of these in U. And that sort of property lets us show that this I sub U is in fact an ideal. It's not, it's not very hard to show. Invariance is key though. So an ideal. When I say ideal, I mean a two-sided idea. So the question is, so for any open invariant subset to get an ideal, are there any other ideals? It turns out there might be, and things are still sort of complicated which you may suspect from your graph algebra knowledge. So we're going to restrict again, and we're going to restrict our attention to things called strongly effective group voids. So this starts to be a bit technical. So what is strongly effective? It says for every closed invariant subset C of the unit space, the restriction of our group void to C is effective. So we need that condition. But what does this relate to in terms of graph conditions? Any guesses? What's the other condition you have on graphs? It's condition K. I should have not put it up there. I quizzed you. Do you remember what condition K is? Could you say what condition K was with my convention? It's exactly the same. It doesn't matter the arrow direction. But if you have a directed graph, then the group void is, the boundary path group void is strongly effective if and only if it satisfies the <coughs> So you can prove that. I don't have the proof here. It's true. And then we have a theorem, uh, a number of people, that says if you have a strongly effective group void, then this correspondence between open and variant subsets and the ideal I of U, U to I of U, is in fact a lattice isomorphism from the lattice of open and variant subsets to the lattice of ideals in the Steinberg algebra. So in a strongly effective setting, these are on our ideals. Now I'll talk a little about what is the lattice structure on the collection of open and variant subsets. So the lattice, we need a partial order join and a meet, but it's quite straightforward. It's just the partial order is containment, join and meet are union and intersection. So that's the lattice structure there. Similarly for ideas. 
So from translated to Levit path algebra, what does this mean? Well, we'll get to the, we need to translate this to Levit path algebras. You should be able to, we can translate going through this, the algebras. Let's do that quick. So this says we have, if our viewpoint is strongly effective, we know all the ideals are of the form IU. We also know strongly effective implies condition K, meaning all ideals of the Levit path algebra come from saturated hereditary subsets. So the correspondence is between those two things. You can get, and I'll talk about it in a minute, glass has to move between those. And we can do the same sort of thing about graded ideals. You might think to yourself, okay, so strongly effective, should these things be all the graded ideals, and we need to be careful. So again, we need to put a hypothesis. So if we have this co-cycle C from G to this root of gamma, that could be a trivial thing. So the gradient could have no structure at all. So we need this theorem. We need it to put this condition that the inverse image of the identity is, in fact, strongly effective. It doesn't mean the whole group void is strongly effective. It just means this zero graded bit with the bit rate of identity. If that's true, then a result, recent result here with Rui and 3XL and Enrique Pardo says this correspondence U to IU gives you all the graded ideas. So that's true always in the Levitt path algebra. And again, the Levitt path algebra, we talked about how the inverse image of zero, the zero graded bit is effective. It's in fact strongly effective. It's in fact even better than that. It's so this is relating to the question, what are the open invariant subsets of the unit space? You should sort of have a sense, we talked about by tracing your way through the algebras, but we should be able to do it from graph to group void without having to go through the algebras to do it. All right, I'm going to skip this and come back in a minute. Just look at this corollary. I'm going to draw your attention to the corollary. So if you have a row finite directed graph, you don't have any of those infinite things. We don't have to worry about breaking vertices. So we can get this lattice isomorphism from the open invariant subsets of the unit space onto the lattice of saturated hereditary subsets, E0. And so this situation is pretty straightforward. But why I skipped is because this is another place where it seems like the groupoid model helps we can deal with the more general situation where you have a non-real finite graph. And Nubia talked about this yesterday. So in this case, the lattice isomorphism of the Levitt path algebra isn't between saturated hereditary subsets and the ideals, if, you say, if condition K is satisfied. Instead, you have to worry about these breaking vertices. So, so I'll fix a saturated and hereditary subset H of vertices. This is my convention, what a breaking vertice vertex is. So the breaking vertices B sub H consists of those vertices which are infinite receivers, which do not belong to H, and for which the sources of the edges they receive are all, except for a finite number, uh, non-zero number inside of H. So the picture is sort of like, if you think of this as H, here's a vertex, it's a breaking vertex. If, infinite number going here, and a finite number might go out. So a finite number out, infinite here, need to be more than, can't be zero going out. So we talked about that yesterday. So the isomorphism is between the lattice of pairs, H, S, where H is a saturated hereditary subset, S is a subset of these breaking vertices, um, onto the lattice of graded ideals of the directed graph, where if you're satisfied condition K, then all ideals. But in particular, we saw this a little yesterday too, the lattice structure in here is, is somewhat complicated, even with the partial order relation looks like. I don't remember what it is, and I wrote it down, but she had to look it up. Yeah. So it's a bit messy. So, so these results you can deduce from that for the, for the Steinberg algebra? Well, based on this theorem, then we could translate around through the Steinberg algebra. 
So the theorem says that if you have a directed graph, arbitrary, non real finite, you do get a lattice isomorphism from the lattice of open and various subsets of the unit space onto these admissible pairs that are called these pairs. Of the lattice of pairs HS or H is such a referential subset, and S is a subset of the breaking vertices. And the key, why I think this helps, although the lattice structure on the homomain side here, the range, is ugly, in my opinion, the lattice on the groupoid side is still the standard lattice structure. It's just subset, union, and intersection. So it's easier to work with, I think, over the various subsets so once you get the isomorphism. So and this is related to our work on the center. We sort of figured this out first. Um, yeah, so, and then you could use a corollary. This is what we already talked about, so I'll skip that. Um, so I'll quickly talk about this. I won't spend a lot of time on this either. So what we were able to do, we, I, wasn't, I had a student who was working on this. We decided to think about, we knew what all our ideals looked like. Um, if your group point is strongly graded and the coefficient <coughs> ring is a field. So we decided to give a go to try to figure out what all the ideals look like if that coefficient ring is just a commutative commutative ring. To figure out how the ideals in the ring interact and make ideals in the algebra. So that's what we did. So ideals in the ring do give rise to ideals in the algebra. So this example here, if you just take the trivial group, it's really easy to see. Um, so G is effective because there are no nothing outside of the unit space, it's just a unit, and there are no non-trivial open and varied subsets of the unit space. There's only a singleton, so it's the only subset you have is trivial. But then you can it's clear that the Steinberg algebra is in fact the ring isomorphic, and every ideal of the ring is an ideal of the Steinberg algebra. So. In this case, it's really easy. And in fact, if you could show that if G is effective and there are no non-trivial open invariant subsets, then you, that's the condition for simplicity when your coefficients are the field. So really, the only rings, uh, ideals you get are the ones in the ring. So you get a lattice isomorphism between the ideals in the ring and ideals in the algebra. But we want to do better than that. So we're going to just, this looks really ugly, but it's sort of fun to play with. Like once you get yourself through the notation. So we'll let this OE denote the set of all non empty open and various subsets of the unit space. And oops, oops sorry. We'll let LR denote the set, well, I guess the lattice, of ideals in R. And we're going to define a particular set of functions. So we'll let this capital F denote the set of all functions. So a function from the open and various subsets to the ideals such that this condition holds. Now the idea is, if your open and variant subsets are disjoint, all is well, like you can just sort of, the ideals that those things give you, associate each one of those to an ideal in the ring, and all is well. The thing you have to be careful about is when those open and variant subsets are overlapping. And so the condition here is, it's a function for open and variant subsets to the ideals in the ring such that if you take a collection of open and variant subsets, its union is an open and variant subset. You can prove that. What ideal in the ring that gives you when you do the union is the intersection of all the ideals that you get in here. So there's this, this is how it works. So if you have a strongly affected group void, then there's a bijection between this collection of functions f and the ideals in the Steinberg algebra, such that, and there's the formula. I've been trained in the school that if you're going to say something is bijective or isomorphic, you should say what the isomorphism of the bijection is, so I've done that. But it, it's a good sort of way to play. So what is the corollary in the uh, Levitkap algebra setting? Again, it looks pretty ugly. But if you have a real finite <coughs> directed graph, that's all I'm going to worry about right now, and satisfies condition K, the strongly effective thing. We're going to look at functions from, this is the saturated and hereditary subsets onto the 
ideas in the ring that satisfy this. So this is the closure thing we are talking about. If you take a collection of saturated hereditary subsets, this is sort of the operation. Take their union and get the saturated hereditary subset that that's contained in. So if you take that, it's a similar thing, just translated. And then this map between the two gives you a bijection between the, this collection of functions and all ideals in the left path algebra. And I was just thinking, listening to talks, like you, people here know how to write down in general uh, what all the ideals of the Levitt path algebra are, right? Not even if they satisfy condition K. So I feel like there ought to be a way to combine this sort of technique and write down all ideals in the, the Levitt path algebra where the coefficients are not necessarily in the field. So just to demonstrate this quickly, I have this graph. So this is my convention. So you can take some time and try to think about what the group point looks like, but don't worry about it too much. What are the um, ideas? So I'm going to look at the Lagopath path algebra over the ring of integers. And we'll write down all ideals in this. This satisfies condition K, correct? If you use my convention, even if you don't. If you want to redraw this on your piece of paper and switch the arrow direction of that thing between me and B1 and 2. So the lattice of ideals associated to the ring of integers is just Nz, where n is a natural number. Yeah. What are the saturated and hereditary subsets of this? You know, the definition switches in your mind, but if you rewrote the graph with the arrow switch, you get that B2 is a saturated hereditary subset, as is the and then suppose I have that f I talked about. I'm just going to try to demonstrate what it is. So if you had some function, these are functions from saturated hereditary subsets to ideals in the ring. So suppose you had one that took the saturated hereditary subset v2 to the ideal 2z. Then the condition would tell us sort of what that had to do. Let's see if I can go back. So in that example, the V1, V2 is a combination of the V2 and the whole thing. So it needs to be an intersection there. So it must be of the form 2NZ to get that condition to work. And then we have a formula that will sort of tell us what the general ideal would look like. So this gets somewhat notationally ugly, but it's sort of fun to play and sort of interesting to see the sorts of graphs we had in mind were these trees that had lots of overlapping uh, saturated hereditary subsets that you had to keep track of that helped us figure out what to do. And we'll stop there. Yeah. Okay, let's close. I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. In your previous example, can you go back? Yeah. What happens if you take and then another ideal? Uh, okay, the question is: we took pi to v two to v two z. Yeah. Uh, is it not possible to take pi of v one v two to be another ideal? Maybe so the whole pi, whatever this is, maybe it would have been more illuminating if I said this is m z, yeah. some ideal. Uh -huh. Then whatever this went to would have to go to m m z. There are no such ideals, or those are the only kinds of ideals that will give you ideals, distinct ideals in the level of path algebra. I don't, I don't think I'm answering your question. Uh, so okay. it says so this f is the set of all functions that are maps that take ah, the collection of saturated. Why this equation? Okay, I got you. I got you. Okay. So I'm trying to demonstrate how it satisfies this equation. So the only functions we're interested in are ones that satisfy this equation, and that can give you an idea in a particular way. And those are all the ideals that appear. Those are appear. all the ideals, and it was hard work to get that it was surjective, that you got all the ideals. Okay. And we did it in a group voice setting, and it just applies to this. But we had to seriously use that strongly effective, which was an ugly sort of condition, so we had to eventually get ourselves some clues and very subset that was effective and use that. It was hard work.
I'm, I'm maybe there's a better way to do it. So uh, yeah, this this if instead you put here the ideals of the left path algebra when the coefficient ring was a field and had some sort of condition like this, I bet you you could prove it there for all ideals for arbitrary left path algebra where the ring was not here. Uh, the question we posed before about uh, if there are results obtained from from the left side to the yeah. to the C yeah, star push. Your, push button. Push. This one. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So there are uh, at least two papers. In in one paper we we determined the. Let me, let me say, the compact graph C star algebras, Johnny with Candido and Loli, and we, we study first the, the structure for the Levitt path algebras, and then use the result that the uh, graph C star algebras is the completion of the Levitt path right. algebra. We have to develop more machinery, but... So you are able to take your insight and let it Maybe it's just a question, um, because the graph C star algebras came first, there aren't as many things they don't know, and if you find things like that, yeah. And also in the first paper we did about the center, we compute the center of a price graph C star algebra from the from the lady path algebra side. So, uh, so there are some results. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So for the lady path algebra, did you check out? I usually sit in the back and I know you can't hear back there. Uh, for the Levit path algebra, if you take a sub-algebra, and you can consider the Levit path algebra of the subalgebra. Is it in any way related to the real? But the Levit issue path. if you take a subalgebra. A subgraph. Okay. So you have a. Or in your setting, you can think of sub. Subgroup uh, points. points. Yeah. I mean, subgroup points are more general in that in that Morita equivalence result I was talking about in particular. The sometimes thing, if you're interested in Levit path algebra, is getting that the sub thing is again a Levit path algebra. So I think subgroupoids are more general. I think a subgraph would give you a subgroupoid. That made sense in a certain way, but a subgroupoid could be more general. But suppose we are in a Levitt path algebra and we take a subgraph, yeah. and then we consider the Levitt path algebra associated with that subgraph. How is that related to the original? So that's a Levitt path. Any Levitt path algebra person know the answer to that? Levitt path algebra of a subgraph. How does that relate to the? Well, <laughs> so any, you take a Levitt algebra, it will not. There could be anything, right? It could be. The Levitt algebra will not be as possible. Complete means what? Condition. Uh, remember about sorry. Yes. Uh, if you emit some edge uh, in the satrap, then you have to emit all edges, emit a little bit in the graph. Uh, this is in order to preserve CK1 and CK2, well, especially CK2. Yeah. And then you uh, let it pass out for a satrap. If not, you will not be. Yes, yeah, so that makes sense. You have some of these examples we see that are direct sums of things, you could just cross off our it's not isomorphic. We can give some. We can give some conditions under which the sub maybe yeah. part of the sub will be a sub Yeah, that's what I understand. I think Ravella would say something. Ravella would say something. Yeah, she's next, but we have a tea break, so. Yeah, but this is starting. But I don't know how that connects to the group board, for example. What does that say? Would that be something like that? Alright, if there are no more questions, let's thank Lisa for wonderful talks.